Well, hello everyone. Today we're going to talk about designing printed circuit boards, and we're going to talk about doing that with the Eagle CAD program, which is available from uh, from Autodesk. Autodesk is a company that sells a lot of CAD programs, and one of them that they have is Eagle. So welcome today, and let's dive right on in. So today, um, when we talk about Eagle, let me get that screen up. Here we go. Here's myself, and I'm an electrical engineer. My day job, I do engineering management for electrical engineering at a company called EAD Engineering, a company that does uh, mostly industrial manufacturing type work. So I don't do this PC board design stuff for a living. However, I have a hobby business, and it's called Scaled Automation. I design model railroad controllers. Uh, I design those controller boards. I write embedded software for the boards. I write PC software. And of course, the big piece on the designing the circuit boards is to be able to lay them out and order them and get custom boards. My contact data is on there, my phone number and an email. And then, so if you have questions later at some point, you'd like those answered, you'll feel free to uh, contact me, send me an email. So today, here's our objectives. We're going to talk about Autodesk Eagle. And so why Eagle? Why do we want to use that program? And that there are different subscriptions available. Uh, subscriptions is now the preferred method of buying software in many places, including Autodesk. And those um, subscriptions have different price ranges. The good news is for hobbyists and small startup businesses, that cost is free. We'll talk about that later. We'll talk about how to download and install the program a little bit. It's pretty straightforward, so we won't talk about it a lot. We're going to do a PC board design overview. And then we're going to dive into some of the details. Uh, there's going to be an intro to libraries. We'll talk about what libraries are and why. Intro to schematic entry, an intro to board layout, and then how to order a board with a company called Oshpark. Oshpark is pretty amazing because they um, actually have the ability to take the Eagle files directly, which many don't. So download and install, if you hold on just a second, I've got to push another button if I can get it to come up. Okay. Um, so first is verify your system requirements. It runs on Windows, Linux, and Mac. So there are a lot of different options. However, there are specific processor requirements. And so make sure that you have a system that's compatible. Uh, the one thing I really noticed for Windows was that you have to have the ability to, uh, your system has to run in 64 bit. Then you'll choose your subscription, and there are different ones. Again, we'll get into that in a little bit more detail. Click download, install for instructions. It's a standard in install, so it's not hard. Later, you're going to want to probably install additional libraries available across the internet. Uh, Google search can help you find a lot of them. The one that has a lot of parts in it, though, is SparkFun. They're a big player in the do-it-yourself hobbyist electronic world. Uh, lots of others, download is needed. So here's our overview. So here's what we're going to do to design a printed circuit board. You're going to have to gather data sheets of all your components. And the, to obviously, to design the circuit, you're going to need to know what the components do. But here, what's real important, we have to know what's called the footprint of the component. So we need to know exactly how to put those components on the printed circuit board and how big the holes are, the spacing of the holes if they have holes, or what's called pads if they're surface mounted. In the example shown here, you can see a, a mix of, of ones that are mounted by holes, those are called through holes, and ones that are surface mounted where there are pads. If you don't know the spacing and size of those, your board's not gonna work. So having that data sheet's critical. Typically next, we would hand draw a schematic, and that just gives us our basic idea of how things are gonna hook up. It's just easier to hand draw something in pencil than it is to get into the program and start changing it. But if you have a simple schematic, and you'll see that today, you don't necessarily have to do that step. step. And then next, we'll draw the schematic itself in Eagle. And often that's called schematic capture, and it's just a phrase that's used, basically generate the schematic. Then we'll lay out the board, you know, physically place the components, and then route the traces. And you'll see how that's done. The traces are actually the, the signal lines between all the pads and holes. It's what makes the circuit work. 
and they have to be routed on the board so they don't overlap. There is an auto route, and auto route is good if it works, and typically it doesn't work. So I'll show you how to hand that, that's what I do all the time. Last is we're going to run a design rules check, and that checks to make sure that we have everything accounted for. There are no uh, traces that haven't been run. There's no overlaps. Uh, there's no traces that are too close because there are standards for manufacturing. Then we'll order the board. The board comes, we'll assemble it and verify operation. And not uncommon, we will go back to step number three and change the schematic a little bit, or at least step number four, change the layout on the board if things didn't work the way we planned. So that's our design overview. Today, we're gonna to look at an example project. And this project is one that I think is gonna be useful for myself and perhaps for others. And we're going to take a component that's made for prototyping and testing. It's a very nice little board uh, product and it's called the Digilet Analog Discovery 2. And it has analog inputs for an oscilloscope. It has digital inputs for use as a digital logic analyzer. And it even has some outputs for making waveforms for driving circuits and some programmable voltages. So it's a really nice little circuit. However, it doesn't come in a nice portable case. So we're going to basically, the design today I want to show you, as we take those, that device, we put it in a box, and you can see that on the drawing, and build a custom front panel for it so we can hook things up. But it's, uh, it's not totally from scratch. This is based on an accessory that Digilent sells for the Analog Discovery 2, and that piece is called the Digilent Discovery DNC. BNC is a type of connector. It's the ones that are used to hook up oscilloscope probes. So we're going to add a board so that we have a place to mount those things and hook them up to the front panel. We're also going to add a couple little features. Uh, and again, the whole point of this is to make it portable. So that's, our, that's what we're going to do today for printed circuit board is we're going to design the board that goes into the front panel. So our project basis in a sense. So this is the board that we're essentially duplicating. Now I couldn't use this for my device because you can see the BNC connectors actually point two opposite directions. So if you're to put that on a front panel, it's just not gonna work because they're pointing in the wrong direction. And then the other thing is, is that on the right side of the board in this picture, there's an expansion port and that's where you put in, plug in the digital IO for the digital logic analyzer well, again, if the BNCs were pointing out the front, those would not be there. So we're basically going to take this board and we're going to change it around. We're going to change the location of components. So we're going to make our own custom printed circuit board that kind of duplicates this effort. One of the features that we're going to add, though, is that if you see the blue jumpers, we're going to make those switches instead of jumpers. So that'll make it a little bit easier on the use of the device. We need to change those, what those jumpers do. We will do that. I'll show you what they do in just a minute. On the right picture is the schematic that Digilent publishes. So they are very nice to have already given us the schematic for it. We just have to put that into Eagle. So very simple uh, project here, but will provide a lot of useful functions. So let's talk about Eagle a little bit. And the important part about Eagle is that, to me, I think of three basic components to this thing. And one is, is that we have a library of devices. And I'll show you the parts of those library in, in just a minute. But it, there are many libraries already included with Eagle, so that's really good. Tons and tons of components. They have so many components that it's hard to find what you need. But on the other hand, they have a search function and they're, they're grouped into logical kind of units. So easy to find your components. However, it's also common that even though those components are numerous and there's lots and lots of them, often the one you need is not included. So the important part about this is that you'll be interacting with libraries, not only to pull components out into your design, but also uh, you're going to be using it to create your own components. That's what really makes this program powerful. Like many others, you can make your own components. 
So component parts or devices, as they call it, have three parts. The first part is what is the symbol that goes on the schematic? And you can see that on the, uh, the picture here, the image that we have here in the upper right corner and in the left part of the upper right corner, that's what the symbol would look like on the schematic. Next to that are two other views. The top right one is actually what is called the footprint. And that's what goes on the printed circuit board. The big red rectangles will be the pads that eventually the product will be, the device will be soldered to. And then the bottom one is a 3D package. So one of the things that's important, maybe a good time to mention this is that, so what about the 3D package? Why is that important? Well, Eagle is now integrated uh, with uh, what's called Fusion 360. And Fusion 360, uh, is a 3D design package. So not only can you design your printed circuit boards, but you can use it in your 3D design, place it, make sure you don't have interference. So very powerful. So again, I'm going to point out that there are likely devices that are not included in the standard libraries. So if you can, it's much easier to go find them. Use Google search. Uh, always a good idea. And if that doesn't work, then you're going to have to make them from scratch. Now today, we're not gonna have time to go into building our own components. We'll save that for a future session. Uh, so this is our basic use of Eagle, including built-in components, and we'll do an advanced one, and it will actually, a lot of it will be focused on how to make our own components. So next we have schematics. And um, schematics are, <laughs> Schematic entry is basically uh, how we're going to put the design into, into Eagle. And I'm going to stop for just a minute because it seems like we must have skipped the part about the subscriptions. So if you don't mind, I'm going to make sure that we have covered that. Oops. And I'll come back to this. So somehow I skipped over that. I apologize to back up. So different subscriptions with Eagle. First point is Eagle is now only available with Fusion 360. And that's um, an interesting way they've decided to do this. Eagle used to be a standalone program by itself and you did not get Fusion 360. Well, now you get it with Fusion 360. Uh, it's very nice if you're going to use Fusion 360 because you have it all in one place. Um, but if you didn't need Fusion 360, you're kind of paying for something you don't need. So the standard subscription uh, is, uh, again, for the combination of Fusion 360 and Eagle, is $60 per month or $495 per year. And again, only a subscription. You can't buy it outright anymore. They just don't do that anymore. Uh, this is a change, and it occurred uh, January 1st. So when I was planning this, presentation, I was going to tell you this is a really good deal because you can get Eagle for only $15 a month. And that's what my subscription is right now, but they decided to bundle it with Fusion 360 and increase the cost. So it, again, a, not a bad deal, pretty good deal if, if you're going to use both features, but not real good if you're just wanting to use Eagle. Um, and the other thing they did, it used to come in three different versions, a free version, which was very limited, and then a standard version, which is what I have, and a premium version. The premium version, almost a thousand schematic sheets, 16 layer boards, and unlimited board size. Well, I didn't need the 16 layers, I didn't need the unlimited board size, so I used the next lower one. Now you can only get the premium version though. There is good news though. If uh, you're a student or an instructor, the education license is free for both three, Fusion 360 and Eagle Premium. So good deal if you're a student, take advantage of it. In addition, they have what they call personal use. And personal use, you can look on the Autodesk site and they define that. And what it really amounts to is if you're doing it for a hobby, um, you're not gonna build a sellable product. Or if you're a small company and you have very low revenues, it's extremely low, I think it's like $1,000 per year then it's also free. It says for one year, you probably could extend it, but uh, so personal use, uh, also free, so not a bad deal. 
And then finally, trial use, it's free for 30 days. So 30 days free use, you, know, you can try it out, see if you like it, and then, um, and then pay the subscription if you need to. So again, sorry we missed that slide. We'll go back to where we were. So libraries, let's talk about them just a little bit, a little bit more. And so um, again, I want to emphasize that they hold the basic components that you're going to need, uh, the schematic symbol and the footprint. And because we're going to pull parts out of the library to make our schematics, I kind of view it in a way as the first step. Uh, the first thing you'll do is to try to make the schematic, but immediately you're going to have to start pulling components out of the library. So we'll give you some examples of that in just a minute. And then the other one that's real important is the footprint. I'll talk more about that too as we go. So schematics, let's get back to that. So we're going to add devices from the libraries. Use the search feature. If you don't have them, add them from the internet. And if you can't find them on the internet, you get tired of searching and create them from scratch. And maybe a little hint here, uh, I've downloaded some parts off the internet, I've used their standard, and a lot of times they still are not the right size. So the pads are too small, uh, or something is just not appropriate, and they end up modifying them anyway. Well, if that was the case, it probably would have been just about as fast to create them from scratch. Just, uh, and then of course to do that, you're going to need to use uh, micrometers, dial micrometers or whatever you have to measure the sizes of the components and the spacing. Uh, you'll, need a, you'll need a tool to do that. But you also have to have the parts in hand. So another one of my standard practices is I don't order, order the boards until I have the parts, especially if they're unique parts. If they're standard parts, no big deal. Order the boards and the parts same time. But in the example we're going to use here, I want to give you an example of why that would have not have worked. So we're going to add your devices uh, into the schematic sheet and pull them off of the libraries. But then you're going to have to hook them up. And Eagle calls those nets. And, but you can think of them as wires. There'll eventually be traces on the board. So it's not really a wire, it's really a trace. Uh, but they call them nets. They get, you can give them names to make sense out of them. I'll show you how that works. And then wherever two wires or traces have to connect on your schematic, use dots, and those are junctions to make sure that everything's on the same net. Uh, name the wires, and name it for the signal that's on the wire. That just makes sense because it's going to be so much easier to, to keep track of. And then anytime you use that same name anywhere on the board, they will automatically connect. And this is really cool because this means, unlike a traditional schematic where you had to draw the wire from uh, pin one to pin three on another device or whatever the example is, you don't have to draw it all the way. You just give it a name and it'll automatically connect them. And you'll see how that makes the schematic so much simpler, much simpler to draw and very much easier to read. You can also add a text and title block if desired. Uh, so uh, that just kind of makes it look pretty. Don't have to. This example that's on the screen does not have a title block. Uh, so, but you can add them if you like. So what we're going to do now is we're going to switch over and we're going to look at Eagle itself. And we're going to look at this schematic. Now this schematic has already had parts put into it. This is the full-blown final example. And if you see there, you'll notice that the traces don't really connect from point to point. They really just use the naming. So the naming helps us to keep this much simpler. So this is what it's going to look like when we're done. We'll do one more switch of the screen here real quick. And when we make the board, this is what the board's going to look like. Uh, it's already been laid out. And now let's go through some steps on how we did that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have Eagle switch over to this basic design, but it's saved at an earlier stage. So I'm going to use File Open, and I'm going to go to where Eagle has got this saved, where I saved it. I'm going to go to some examples. And I'll 
transfers back over to the schematic. So in this example, again, I've already placed all the components, uh, but I can show you how to do that real quick. And so, for example, we want to place in a new resistor. And so we go and open up. We open up our add component part and my computer is thinking because it's got a lot of things going on right now. And we're going to go down to the resistor point. And I'll double check to make sure where that's at. I think for this one, we're using my custom library. So what we did, what I did here is I made my own custom library and you can do that. You can build your own, makes it a lot easier when you build your own parts to put them in there. And so we're going to pull it out of, there it is. You'll notice I've made quite a few. This particular one is resistor surface mount device 0805. And for folks that know devices, that means this is surface mount and it's the 08 series, which is a size. Uh, the 08s are big enough to hand solder. So my prototypes I hand solder. So I want parts that are big enough. They make them in much smaller sizes, um, but this is the size that I'm using. So I'm going to hit OK. And then on the circuit board itself, or on the schematic, sorry, then you'll notice I can move it around to whatever I want. As soon as I pop it down, then it adds the correct series number. It's an R, and the next one in the series was 5. I can add another one if I like, and it becomes R6. So it automatically pops back the library, and I'll cancel. The wires, and notice this is off of the toolbar on the left side. There's all these different uh, things to do. And so understanding all these parts, you'll learn as you go. And the one I want to hook things up is called net. Again, it calls it a net, not a wire or a trace. But I'm going to put a net on there, and I'm going to pull one off of R5. I'm going to pull one off of R6. Add one on the output of R5, on the output of R6. Notice they're really easy to do. And suppose I want these to connect together on their output. And I do that. But they may not have connected, so to make sure I'm going to put a junction or a dot right there. And we're going to connect them. And that means that those are now connected together. We're going to leave those like they are, but I'm going to show you one little trick. Um, and that is that instead of putting a ground symbol, I can actually change the name. So I'm going to right click on the net, go to name, and I'm going to type in GMD for ground. Network. And I can now put the text anywhere that I want. I'll put it right there next to it. And on the input side, I can do the same thing. I don't have to draw it over to another component here. I can just name it. So, and that naming will automatically connect it. So for an example, I'm going to connect it over to trigger one. And one of the circuits that's on here, again, right click and name. Uh, type in the name of the net I want, trigger one. And I put it next to the wire, the net, so I know that's what it is. And I'll do the same for the other one. Right click name, trig two. So see, instead of having to actually run that wire all the way over to the left side of the board, uh, the schematic or to where the trig one and the trig two uh, receives its actual uh, connection point, its signal point, I can just put the name. And that's really handy because that means now I don't have to just, I don't have to figure out how to draw all these wires and make them look pretty. So. So this was something I added for demonstration, but I really don't want it on my board. So I'm going to do another quick trick here. And over on the toolpad, there's a little icon for group. And grouping is tricky. Grouping takes a while to figure out. It drove me nuts. So I'm going to hit group, and I'm going to put a group around all that. And here's the tricky part, is if I hit, you'd think it'd be ready to go, but if I hit delete, which is what I want to do, it still didn't collect you know, do that to the group, I have to right click over here. And right click is the trick. Once you group something, always right click after you press the command and here delete the group. So I can delete it that quickly. So our schematic is all filled out. We've got everything in it that we need. 
all our parts are there, but now we need to switch over to the board. And so uh, under file, it says switch to board. That's one way to get it. Once it's there, you can also do it under window and board. We'll do it under file because that'll be the first way you do it. Switch to board and it switches to the board view. Now here's something really important to note. I, because of time factor, I've already placed the components where they needed to go. But there, there is what's called air wires. So that's these little yellow traces. Maybe a little difficult to see on your screen because they're so small. But these air wires, what's really interesting about them is if I move a part around, so I'm going to move this particular component, notice how the air wires just stretch around. So they, when you lay this out, you, there's a couple you know, things you're going to look for. One is how do I want it to lay out? What, what do I want where? And then the second one is how can I lay it out so I have air wires that don't cross over too much? Because these air wires are going to become traces, and as they become traces, if they cross over a lot, it's going to be a lot more work. So we're going to just go ahead and put this one right back where he was and start dealing with air wires. So air wires are our connections. Those are our signals. And if we name those signals, that's what these traces will be named. And if I put my cursor, or sorry, right click on one of these, um, it should tell me where, what it is. And I'm not seeing it. But, um, but each one of these has a name. And so we're going to start connecting these air wires. And I always start with the easy ones. The easy ones are the ones that are close. They're close together. There's not much to them. I'm going to zoom way in here. And so there's an air wire between this resistor and this switch. I want to turn that into a trace. I'm going to do these one at a time. So I'm going to hit the route air wire switch or command over here. And this is manual. So this, what we're going to do is route it manually. And at the top, there are some, there's a little set of commands here. There's, I can move it from the top to the bottom layer. I can change how that as I, I put it in, how I want it to route. And in this case, I want it to route straight, with, but with angles, not, not right angles. So I want that one. And I always use a minimum trace width of 12. Uh, trace widths uh, themselves, uh, something you need to understand. If you have a lot of current, you need a wider trace. But for just signals, 12 is good. Minimum is 6. I always go 12 uh, for the boards I do. I don't need ones that are bigger. Now that I've got it selected, though, when I click on that air wire, watch what it does. It starts converting it, and I can move that trace around, and it's kind of telling me where I want to go. So I'm going to come straight off the switch and straight into the That's how simple that is. It is so easy and quick to do. Once you set it up on the right layer, in this case the top layer, the width of 12, and the right and the way that it's going to draw it, which is straight lines with angles. I'm going to do the same for the other one right next to it. And notice that it, it automatically making it only 45s. That's kind of cool. Uh, and quickly I can do that. Let's do a couple more. Now here's one that's interesting. Because this is our BNC connector and it has metal on the bottom, I really don't want that to be on the top. I want that one to be on the bottom. And so I'm going to switch my layer to bottom and route that one. And I want it to come straight out of here, straight over, and then very quick to do. Well, since I'm here, we'll do the other one. So we're just going to keep doing that for the entire board. That's how we're going to do this. And while we're here, one thing I want to show you, notice how this trace got a little bit close. Well, it's fine, but on the other hand, you know, I'm picky, so I want it to be not quite as close. I'm going to choose the arrows, and it's, it's a kind of a cross, so I can move things up and down and left and right with that. And it's the move command. So I've chosen that as my current command. I grab the trace, and now I can move it so that it's more centered. just looks better. That's about the only reason I'm doing that. Okay, so let's trace some more. Grab our route air wire trace command, put it back on top, and I'll route the one to this resistor. Right here. So 
And then we have one move between these two, the capacitor and the resistor. Okay. As you can see, the sand routing is actually very quick and easy. Let's do some more. Show you something I didn't really care for, okay? Again, I'm picking. We've got a little dog leg here. Again, our, our move command, let's just move it, and I can take that out. Just that quick. See what that did? Just that quick. And make it pretty. It electrically would work fine. It's just that, again, I like things nice and neat. So here's another one. Let's go back to our air wire routing command. And we're going to route it to here. Modify that once it's there. So let's take this guy and move it down a little bit. Just that easy. Not hard at all. Go back to our routing command. Okay, this one here. Again, this one I want on the bottom, so I'll choose the bottom, come on down. Same with this one, route it over. Now this one's tricky. So now we're gonna do something that's a little tricky. And we're gonna go, I want it on the bottom to get out from underneath that entire BNC connector, but I'm gonna have to move the circuit to the top. And the reason I have to move it to the top is that it's a surface mounted resistor on the top. So I can't route it all the way on the bottom. I've got to sooner or later switch over. And Eagle has a really nice feature to do that. And it's the use on a scroll wheel mouse. It's the, you press the scroll wheel. And so I'm going to press it. And that automatically adds what's called a VIA. And I don't know why that name came from. They just call it that. And it's, it's like a plated through hole just for routing the signal. And so by doing that, and then I have to press, because I can move it around still, um, I want to press the left hand mouse button and that'll place it and it'll automatically switch me to the top layer. See how it went red? It's very hard to see, you may not see it on your screen. But it's so let's redo that. I'm gonna undo it with the control Z, take it back out. We'll start over again, switch to bottom because I want to be on the bottom. Middle mouse button click, that makes a via. Then right, I'm oh, sorry, left mouse button click to place it and then start. Really easy way to go from top to bottom. Okay, let's go ahead and do another one. And I'm gonna show you a standard practice for me. You can do it however you want. This is my standard practice. And there are exceptions or some on this board already. But when I'm routing traces, I actually want to have the verticals. I want to make one side of the board almost all verticals. And I want to make the other side of the board all horizontals. And it's just as a way that you can get more traces in the same area without overlapping and blocking traces in. It's just, it's just the way it's, that works good. So I'm going to start out, I'm going to do a horizontal trace, and I put them on the bottom. And again, that's arbitrary. That can be done either way. I'm going to come on over. I'm going to do a via, so middle mouse button click, left mouse button click to place it. Now I'm on the top layer, so I'm going vertical. And I'm going to do one more of those. I'm going to put another via, middle mouse button click, left mouse button mouse button click to place it. Now I'm back into the, hor the horizontal ones on the bottom layer. And you'll notice that one thing that happened was I immediately went right underneath that resistor. Well, it's no big deal because the resistor's on the top and, and the trace is on the bottom. So they don't interfere. Now I'm gonna get on over here and I need to, I'm gonna zoom in here so you can see it. Notice my air wire here is showing I'm going to this pad number two. And I need to get this back over into that one. So I'm going to do another via and I'm going to route it up through. 
very, very simple, very easy to do. And this is not really efficient, right? It's got a little T here. So let's modify it and let's move that via, move it up just like that. When it did that, it automatically moved the trace, gave us a little jog here using the same moving command, move that one to make it nice and clean. Again, that's just me being picky and doing things the picky way. So this particular design is not overly complex. Um, it's just got a lot of little traces and you'll spend a lot of time doing traces. So when we're doing the boards, again, you place the components as needed. Um, notice we put in some corner mounting holes. Those are in the holes library. Uh, we made the holes, we chose the one big enough for number six screws um, uh, in this case and, uh, and put them in the corners. I did that first, by the way, because that meant I reserved that area. So let's do some more tracing. And over here, we actually have two parallel connectors that we want the circuits to connect from one to the other. So this is a really simple connection thing. Oops, I put the wrong spot. And these are horizontals, so I'm going to mostly do it on the bottom layer. I'm going to start the first one on the bottom. And see how it just goes over to the corresponding pin on the other side? See how it just goes from one to the other? So these are going to be basically two connectors in parallel. On this circuit, the reason for that is one is going to connect to the analog discovery two board. And the other is going to connect on the front panel so that we can expand, have those signals available on the front panel. Well, let me show you what would happen if I did that to the, the other signal. As soon as I get here, it doesn't like that because we, we're trying to cross over two signals. The program is extremely smart and it won't let me cross over. So you say, well, hey, you could go down here. I get to the next level, to the next two. Now I've got an area that's not going to work. So I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm going to use an, I could use control Z, which I showed you before, but I'm going to show you another command. And this command is called rip up. And so I'm going to take and these particular traces, I didn't like how they routed, so I'm rip them up. So I chose the rip up command. Now I'm going to use my mouse. I'm going to click on one at a time. And it'll take out one segment at a time, going all the way back. So instead of doing it on the bottom layer, Instead, I'm going to put this on the top layer. And so I'm going to take it and notice now I don't have any problem because I'm on the other side of the board. Pull it over and connect. So that's how we're going to connect. And we're just going to keep doing this. We're just going to do it until we get tired of doing it. So take another signal, route it over. Switch it over to the top. You'll notice I'm not doing this the most efficient way because I'm going to stay on one layer, top or bottom, and just keep going. But I'm going to do it this way just to, uh, for illustration. So I'll switch that to the bottom. Let's do a couple now that we where we just uh, keep going on the box. over to the top layer. Again, I can overlap that trace because I'm on the other side of the board.
the bottoms. Finish off those bottom traces. I hear I made a mistake, right? Use my rip up command. Make it too long. I'll do that. Let's rip it back up and then replace it. Again, I got a little wiggle. Use the move command and pull it, pull it back down. You'll also notice these two aren't right on top of each other, and I'm a little bit close here on this pad. So again, with the move command still in play, I can grab that one and move it down. So easy to do to fix. Don't worry too much about making errors because you can always fix it. Either cutting command, got some more here to the top. Um, and again, I want to point out that the order of this stuff is not that important. You can do them in just about any order. So let's do one over here to this pad. Uh, this pad, these set of pads are to go to some binding posts uh, to, so that we can have some programmable voltage outputs. That is one of the added features that the board that we're replacing did not have those pads, so uh, did not have binding posts. So we're gonna add a little bit of features to it. And I need to have put those to a binding post. They're not mounted on this board, they're separate. Uh, that was to save cost on the board because you pay for the board by the square inch. So we're now gonna add a new trace. And I'm gonna do something a little bit different because these traces are uh, voltage that would drive some current we want to have them a little bit wider. So instead of 12, I'm going to move these up to 24s. And now when I route it, and I'm going to route them on the bottom, which will go on mostly horizontal. And you can see the difference in width by moving it to a 24. Um, the other thing is we don't, because we're going to be coming from the other uh, connector, we also want those to be 24s. So how do I do that? Well, I'm going to right click on one of these traces. See where my cursor's right on top of it. I'll zoom in more. Put my cursor on top of the trace, right click, and at the bottom is properties, and there's a width, and so we'll change that to 24. So notice if you do something wrong, you can fix just about anything. Well, you want to do that all the way back, so let's click that segment, properties, and 24. Go back over here, click the third segment, properties, size 24. And we want to do the same for the adjacent trace because it's also one of the outputs. So let's change that one to 24. And if we'd have been thinking ahead, we'd have done this as we put it in. I just wanted to really illustrate that you can do it later as well. Okay, so we got that. Now let's pull that signal out back to our route signal command. Pull it over. As well. So very simple to do. Uh, this is a good time to point out also, if I zoom in to this ground pad, notice there are wires coming off of it, air, air wires coming off of it. Don't route the grounds. And the reason for that is we're going to put in a very large ground plane later and it'll do all those connections for us. So we don't have to route the ground signals, we use ground planes. So um, let's do a couple more here. And so here we have uh, one that's going to be one of the signal traces. We'll go back to 12 for a size. Make sure we're on the bottom, that we're on our uh, route air wire command. And start and just do the same thing we did before. Get all these routed. And 
there's a here's a signal ground room, and again I want a large tray, so I'm going to go back to 24s. This one I can't go on the bottom because see I've got a trace in the way. So we'll route that one. Need to get on over to this guy. So very quickly you can see that we've routed all those traces by hand. Uh, got them in there, and so they're good to go. We have a couple more traces that go uh, side to side, so let's do those real quick. And we'll start. And by the way, there's no particular logic in, to this. Um, you just need to tr try to do it in an order that makes sense. I guarantee you, you will come out with some point where you're going to have to start over again and rip up some traces. But on this simple circuit, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. So let's go back to a signal trace size 12, and start routing. And I'm going horizontal, so I can't, I should not be on the red layer, I should be on the bottom layer, the blue layer. Come on over. And I got the same problem, I need to switch over to the top layer so that I can hit that top pad. So middle mouse, click that one, make a via, decide where I want it. Left mouse button click to change it to the right layer. Could choose another one here. So let's do this guy. And I'm going to go back to the bottom. And the reason I'm going to the bottom again, remember, is that, well, that one's sitting ground. I'm going to leave that one for now. Let's do this one. So is that my initial direction is horizontal. So I want to make sure I'm on the bottom. Because remember, my standard, you can choose it exactly opposite. My standard bottom layer is going to be the horizontal traces. I can pull it over directly like this, right? And by the way, notice, let me zoom in here. Notice as I'm going over, it automatically routes around things. This is a nice program. It does a lot of stuff for you. But I don't like that. I don't really want to route it underneath that BNC connector. Uh, that's just, I just don't want it there. It, it would work it, electrically, it would work, but I just don't want them there. So what I really want to do is find a different place to route the signal over. And if you notice what's really nice, zoom in enough so you can see it. Notice that it's also, it's highlighted the air wire that, so I can see where it's going to go eventually. And eventually I got to get to here. So how do I figure out where to do that? I can choose a variety of different routes, but I don't want to go underneath that BNC connector just because I just don't want to. So I'm going to pull it over here, back to where we started, put in a via, and middle click on the mouse to, to start a via, left click on the mouse to place it, come on down. Because I want to go between the VNC connector and the switch. Put another via in, switch back to the bottom layer. So I see how that worked. My, my verticals are in, on the top layer are red in this case. My horizontals are on the bottom layer are blue. So I'm going to come on over here. I notice it's telling me where it's going. So get close to that switch. I'll put in another via because I got to get onto the top layer. Okay, let's choose another one. So let's go back to bottom layer again. Notice that this one's coming out of here. And we've got a little bit of a problem here because we can't, we're kind of landlocked in here. I look real careful here. We're doing okay. We have our clearance. We'll come on out. Another via drop down. An extra dog leg here. Use the move command. And we can clean it up. Don't have to, but it, I just like it. So this looks pretty. Okay. Let's see how we're doing on the signals here. 
We should have, I think we're pretty close. Everything else now is a signal ground or a, um, a regular ground. And we're gonna want to do those with, with uh, what's called copper pores. So I'm gonna switch over now to the one that's been a little bit more finished. And so we're gonna open up the next example. A lot of work is And here you can see that I've got pretty much all of the wires routed. Um, I did do something a little different on S ground. Um, I want separate ground. So I'm going to make a ground pour in the middle, a ground pour on the side. And this particular circuit has three grounds. It's, it's a little unique. It has what they call a W ground, which is for waveforms. It has an S ground for the scope traces. And it has a standard ground for all the others. So to do a, a ground pour, it's actually pretty easy, but you got to know the steps and they're a little tricky. So we're going to do something a little different. Now we're going to use the polygon command. And the polygon command uh, is the way that you do copper pours or it can be any other signal. I'm going to put this polygon around the area where I want to have this particular type of ground. And I want to start it here. And notice I'm outside the board. I go outside the board, I know it's going to automatically take in all of the board. I'm going to switch my routing command to right angles because I'm not going to do anything in the manual. I'm going to do everything right angles. Come on over. And I actually want to pick up this S ground. So I want to pick that guy up. Come on over here. This will make more sense here in just a minute. And we'll come on up and Close that and it asks for a signal name. Well, here I'm going to put SGMD because that's my special ground, signal ground. And notice how it turned it into a dash line. And that was the top, but I also want the same thing on the bottom. So I'm going to switch to the bottom, use the same command, the polygon command. Now it's easier because I can just put it right over the top of the other one. Close that one out. Just it didn't quite touch or it would have closed. There it goes. And GMD, oh, sorry, SGMD. They get the same exact signal. And that one's there. So I want to do the WGMD and the GMD. We'll do those also. And by the way, it doesn't matter top or bottom. So I'm already on the top layer, so or bottom layer, I'm sorry. So I'll start that one. I'm not going to want to overlap that one, so we'll keep it pretty, pretty close there. And this one is WGMD. Switch to the top and do the same thing again for the top. We're on the polygon command. Start the corner. Put over. You might say, hey, John, you're not doing that very efficiently. That's true. But I just find the mouse and move the mouse quicker than trying to drag things around. OK. One more set, and that's going to be the GMD, the regular ground. Polygon command. We're going to start over here. And this time, GMD. And again, switch to the bottom, put the one on the bottom. Just trace it over the top one. GMD. So now we put those copper pore areas, but we don't have any copper in them. So how do we do that? Well, before we do that, let's take a look at some things. So 
I've got a little bit of offset here where there's nothing. So let's move some things. Let's let's move this particular SG S round one. Let's go ahead and move it over. So notice we can use the move command, grab a piece of it and move it around. So you can always make adjustments. So there's a special command, and this special command is called rat's nest. Um, again, it's just traditional in the industry. I don't know where it came from. Rat's nest is going to do something interesting for us. It's going to pour that copper for us. So when I hit rat's nest, an invalid problem. So G and D apparently our polygons did not connect. It looks like what we have here is an extra one. And I think it's on the bottom, so I'm going to use my layer command and return the top off. Well, actually, it looks like it might be. Yeah, it looks like it's on the top is where the problem is. Let's see if we can use our move command and fix that. Okay. Now we've got problems. Okay. Next stage is here. We've finished our board up, and the next stage we're going to do is that we're going to go ahead and order this board. So this is actually the coolest part about Eagle, and that is that we go to Osh Park. And it automatically logged me in. You'll have to create a login. Browse for files right on the front. Go to where the file is saved, which I happen to know. You'll need to keep track of that. Go to Eagle and we're at it saved. Analog discovery, my oscilloscope board. Rev A1 is what I want to do. And I find the BRD, .brd file. That's what they want. Click open and uploading, and they process it. So in a few minutes, they're going to do a design rule check on it, which I've already done. Come on, I'll start. And then it shows you your board. Uh, determine it's the size of the board is 3.5 by 2.25. Three boards will cost $39.45, which is really, really cheap for prototype boards. So that's the part I like. It's awesome. Uh, easy way to order boards that you make at home. Verifies your design. It shows it to you. Scroll on down the bottom, and you place your order. And at that point, they ask you a couple things. They have a couple different options. Uh, the standard option is um, a one-ounce copper and um, and the way you go, you finish your checkout and you're done. And that's it for Eagle. That's our intro. And if there's interest, we will do an advanced one talking about how to build our libraries. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, please contact me. Thank you so much.